This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia. This is another special episode where we uh, respond to listener questions and comments, and we've been going through the Patreon supporter messages. So, um, you guys ready to just jump right into this? Randall? Sure, but we should probably say hello. No, no, no. Let's just jump right into it. Just jump right into it. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. No small talk. No small talk. No small talk. Okay. Right. Straight to biz. Straight, Straight to, to business. business. Okay. <laughs> I can handle it. All right. Well, the first message is from David, and he says, uh, Has anyone transcribed Randall's list of relevant research papers into clickable links to said papers? I would love to volunteer for this project. I am on disability. I have a lot of free time and would be honored to add my effort in any way possible. Sincerely, David. David, we'd be honored to have your effort. So the answer to that is yes. And I'm thinking what we're going to try to do, maybe we'll have a a list of references germane to each of the podcasts that we do. So that if I reference a paper, or even if there's a paper I don't necessarily reference directly, but relates directly to the content of the the, uh, podcast, we would post that in a list, and then over uh, a series of episodes, once we've accumulated accumulated a longer list, we could then publish that more comprehensively. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. So after Sounds we've accumulated great. a dozen or 15 or 20 uh, podcasts, then what we can do is, is uh, publish a master list, say. Ah, uh, yeah. But then that, that can be, be broken great. down um, – Relative to, you know, the, the, the references to each podcast that we do. Right. And we could also mention again, like we have before, the uh, bibliography on the Cosmic Tusk, which is a great resource, not necessarily to- directly connected to the, the stuff we talk about here, but it right. is connected. So. Oh, absolutely. Because many of those papers that are in the Tusk uh, bibliography, we will be referencing. Right. Absolutely. And the new the new website that's being developed, you know, there will be a wing that's research specific. We think, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's still being designed and developed, but the, yeah, that'll be a place for all these, like the oh, bibliography yeah. on Cosmic Tusk. We'll we'll have one on uh, Randall Carlson website right. coming with, up with, coming up soon. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely utilize utilize his skills and appreciate his willingness to uh, to connect those, uh, so people can find them and read them online. Absolutely. So is the new website going to have all 20,000 of Randall's collected papers in there? <laughs> Why not? Isn't that how many you've got? Like 20,000 papers? So let's just put them all in there. <laughs> yeah, it's all of them. Well, <laughs> Dave, I hope, I hope you have uh, at least 30 to 40 years to devote right. to the project. Um, I mean, we're going to expect nothing less. <laughs> That's right. You. At least. <laughs> All right, that's great. Be, care, okay, be so, careful what you volunteer for. That's right? right. Yeah, you never know. I mean, you volunteer <laughs> and next thing you know, slave. No, yep. if this thing uh, <laughs> plays out, Dave, we'll soon we'll have you a whole team of of uh, uh, young graduate students to help you with this project. There so. you go. That's <laughs> where. Yeah, that's where you get the slave labor. Yeah, graduate students. We'll get you some interns. <laughs> All right, this next one is from Kyle. He says, hey, guys, great podcast. Um, and he's responding specifically to episode 14, but he wants to know, he says that he resides in southern Quebec, and he says, and having seen all of Randall's videos, I have become very interested in geology, so much so that although I have an MBA, I plan on starting a degree in geology next year. I know Randall has discussed potential impact crater sites in Canada, primarily the one in Lake Ontario and the one north of Lake Superior. Mm-hmm. Have any one of you guys looked at Lac Saint-Jean, which is north of Quebec City, as a potential impact crater site? Looking at the topographical maps, it appears to me at least that there is the potential for a massive flooding event from Lake Saint-Jean into the St. Lawrence River. I am looking at possibly traveling up there this summer to look at the region, and thanks. This is from Kyle. 
This is from Kyle. It's Kyle. not me. <laughs> not <Okay>. this Kyle. <laughs> okay, this is the other Kyle. That's <laughs> right. Okay. That wants to go back to school. Kyle, uh, I actually, I'm sure I'm probably the only one, but I have looked at Lake St. Jean. And it has, to me, all the characteristics of a melting epicenter and a great rush of water towards the east into the uh, river. Absolutely. And I'm going to pull up um, the, uh, I'll do a screen share here, and we will pull up the, um, the digital map so that we can share this with everybody because it's Quite interesting. All right, are we seeing this? We're seeing it. All right, notice the circularity here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and check this out. Look at this. This looks like some serious erosion in through yes. here to the, to the southeast. And actually, look to the northwest. It looks like you might have had a... Um, a rush of water up to the north, which probably would have then backflowed. And yes, I think this could be a prime candidate, Kyle. So here's what I'd like to do. Stay in touch before you go. I'll do some, see what I can dig up uh, as far as the specifics. Maybe Brad might help me too on that. And we'll see if we can't find some specific places where you could actually go visit and document some stuff for us. Oh, uh, yeah. Because this is actually, when I discovered this, I thought this would be worth a road trip right here. So, Kyle, you could do a little reconnaissance for us. How about that? Um, and we will uh, let us know when you're planning to go uh, so we have a better idea of how much time we got. Um, I presume it would be later in the spring or summer. Um, when, yeah, you when said site, summer. Summer, yeah. So we, we got plenty of time. We'll do some research. We'll come up with some sites. and figure something out that you can go and I'm sure there's going to be some documentation that could happen there. I have no doubt. I mean, I'm looking here yeah. at these, at these spillways here through here. And I would bet we'll find some really interesting stuff that you can uh, photograph or video for us. And uh, who knows, then maybe then we could follow up, bring a whole team up there. Yeah. So I think that's excellent. That's excellent that you brought that up. That's one of those things. I, I do a lot of map work and a lot of study on the, on the maps and Google Earth and so on. And yes, I had actually found this um, and noticed the similarity between it and Lake Nipigon, which I'm going to pull over here, uh, which we've already looked at as a potential impact site because we do know that there was a massive outrush of water to the south that created this landscape that we see right here. And we have spillways, the Black Sturgeon River spillway. Like this right here was a major discharge uh, conduit coming down here. And if you check this out, what we have here, notice we have the uh, typical case of an underfit river you'll notice that the river is much smaller than the channel in which we see it. Let me see if I can shift over to satellite here. And let's see if we can get 3D in here and have a look. Yes, you can see there's, there's, a, there's a spillway all through here and the modern river is much smaller than the spillway. And if we go down here, we'll see that there's a massive splayed out fan-like deposit at the mouth of all of this. So we've already been planning a trip to do some field research up here around the Nipigon region and to explore the possibility that this might have been an impact site. Some interesting stuff here. I mean, we see um, central islands that might be remnants of a, of a multi ring structure. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the geologist's name, Teller, James Teller has done the work on this area. And we'll get to that. We're going to come back. When we start talking about the, the, the catastrophic melting and the, and the mega floods, we will come back to this. So, yeah, I just wanted to show you this because it's extremely interesting. This erosion here 
is pretty spectacular. And there is evidence from bona fide geologists that have spent decades studying this area that there were mega floods through this region. And interestingly, the, de the mega flood that Teller uh, looked at and published papers on uh, is dated to right around 12,900. So that's, uh, that's very auspicious. So yeah, so then let's get back to um, this one. You'll notice here, you have the same kind of a thing. You have a, a basin that now holds a lake. It has arcuate, almost you know three fifths of it here is arcuate. Um, and then you have what looks like could be large scale mega flood outwash, which would make sense. And so, yes, that's a good find, Kyle. Keep up the good what? work, man. Arcuate. Arcuate, yes. A R C U A T E. Add that to your vocabulary, folks. Simply okay. mean arc shaped. Arcuate. Ah. Got it. Got it. Got it. I know. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Sometimes you're a little slow on the draw, Russ, but. <laughs> but. I just, you know, I got to ask. Yeah. So sure. I'm, I'm teasing. I yeah. Heard, I, yeah. Right. I heard the word arc in there and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know what it means, but I want to make sure. Yeah, that's what yeah. it means. You just got yeah. ar an arc shaped, arc arc shaped form. That's all. Right. Arc eight. So, and I hey, say you know what your else? New internet connection and your ability to scroll around maps and Google Earth and yeah. Google Maps is is spectacular. Also, it is awesome. I know it is. It really is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the share. All right. So, okay. Great. That was a, that, yeah, that was good. Thanks, Kyle. Yes. yes. Looking and, forward uh, to 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 um, going further with this. Absolutely. Right. We we'll keep in touch. You just love it that people are paying attention and they're they're reading the landscape with the with these new eyes that that Randall's opened up for them. Yeah, it's yes. awesome. And yeah. so yeah, Kyle's definitely on to something. We need to get up there. All right. So next one is from Tide. I'm pretty. Let me make sure that's. Yeah, he's tied. Okay, he says, Thank you so much to all for producing this material. I am a huge fan and a grateful supporter. I've watched many, most of the Cosmography episodes. I think in fascination about what North America was like with massive herds of proboscidea roaming around with so many other megafauna. And he says, And then that ended. To what do we attribute this force? My main question is, why don't you address the mastodon in the room, Robert Schock's contention that it was a solar proton event slash coronal mass ejection? Well, that's a good question, and let's see how I can answer that. <laughs> when we're looking at this block of time that I generally place at about 3,000 years, from 14.6 to 11.6 is really when we see a lot of the concentrated action taking place. Whatever was going on was extremely complex. And I have every confidence that the sun played a role. Now, exactly what that role was, I'm not gonna say. I've had these discussions with Robert. I think Robert's onto something. He, at one point, he may have modified his view a little bit. At this point, he was, uh, for a while, I know that he was rejecting an idea of an impact hypothesis. Um, I don't think, I think he was giving too much credence to the critics. And we're going to be doing, addressing further some of the, the criticisms. We devoted a, a, the better part of one podcast to uh, the critics of the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Interestingly, those critics that are attacking the impact hypothesis would also attack a solar proton event hypothesis with the, the, the essentially the same, the same zeal. Um, but we're going to look at that. I've got a whole presentation lined up ready to go on the role of the sun and a possible uh, way to explain a dual phenomenon that involves the influx of um, cosmic material into the inner solar system and perhaps a solar response. So we're going to be talking about um, what we've learned since solar observing satellites have been operational. And um, yeah, so we, we've got some good stuff coming up. 
Um, it's just a matter of being able to get to it, you know, and, and we, right. we've all agreed that we're going to try to come up with a way of, for life extension in order to live another century or two so that we can actually get to all of this material. Right. So we're, right. we are working on that. That's right. We're, we're trying to live forever for all, for all of you guys. For all of you guys, yes. We, right. we are seeking immortality. <laughs> yes. I don't want to say it looks like, you know, somebody or a couple of people have hinted that, you know, Randall's poo-pooed the idea of any involvement of the sun. And I want to say no, that's just totally no. inaccurate. He's been looking at it for years. He's included that as part of the climate change issue and the uh, younger driest issue and has never, never said that sun played no role. It's, it's always been part of the bigger picture. It, it is right. complex and it's part of the picture and, and he's got a, uh, quite a detailed show that we're going to get into for at least an episode, like he said here coming up. Yeah. Right. But when you, when you look at the standard model, today's standard model of, of climate change or anthropogenic climate change, the sun is, the mastodon in the room. I, I would agree. With oh, that. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that's a good way to, to, to phrase it. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I am looking forward to the day when they perfect cloning of the flash frozen um, megafauna, because I, I would like to have my own mastodon in the room. Yes. Here. <laughs> I would. Yes. Yeah. I've Lovely. always wanted to have a pet mastodon that I can lead around and maybe ride yeah. yeah, you, you already, have, you already... have the white flag go by, and then there would just be some legs. <laughs> yeah, some tusks <laughs> and legs. That's right. You already have a dire wolf. Now you need a mastodon. <laughs> I do. Yeah, you get. I don't think that the viewers have met Otis yet. He's a, he's a beast. Yeah. Yeah. See, people are going to be upset because now you have this backdrop, and they're not going to be able to see the flag. and they won't be able to see the flag go by. The maybe they flag. will. Maybe maybe the flag will show up real, yeah. real bright. Oh, they'll have to test see. it. Will the dog flag show up? <laughs> it might. Todd, well, Todd, the cat showed up in episode yeah. nineteen. Oh, did oh, he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It'd be interesting if he got on the shelf and it just looked like he was sitting on that sitting boulder on back there. Yeah, <laughs> giant cat on the boulder. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should say, Randall, tell people what the picture is back there. This is something oh, the picture, that's the Okotoks, yeah. Big Rock, so named by the Blackfeet Indians. And this is the largest uh, mega quartzite uh, erratic boulder that is part of the Foothills Erratic Train, whose source was up in the region of Mount Robson and Mount Edith Cavell up in the Jasper Park area. And when we get into the meltdown uh, and the mega floods, we'll be coming back and we'll be looking at that guy right there. Yeah. And we will be um, definitely getting into that. And speak of the devil um, and dire wolves. Here, <laughs> Otis. Come here, buddy. Let's introduce you. Yeah, there you go. Come here, Otis. <laughs> hey, big guy. There he is. <laughs> there he is. There's the big guy. Hey, there's two of them. What's going on? Hey, buddy. <laughs> you, uh, you need to tell people how big he is. Yeah, he's about 440 pounds. It's not. <laughs> no, he's. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. Hey, hey, big guy. Come here, sit still. Man, that looks crazy. It it's does look really flashing real. back and forth between I the know. background. And, That's yeah. a little crazy. So, yeah. oh, and then we have. Oh, there's funny. the other one. Mama yeah. Bella. Okay. Bella. Now, listen, this is not. Oh, look at, <laughs> look at this here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. What did you, oh you haven't had your beating yet today? Okay. <laughs> as soon as we're done here, you can have yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Which, okay. Was it was it Otis that knocked over the? Yes, it was. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, dogs. That's enough. Get lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great. Okay. I can't wait to meet him and the cat, Todd, Todd, the cat, Todd. <laughs> yeah. So Todd. That rascal. <laughs> Let's get this fixed up here. Okay. okay. There you go. So yeah, a yeah. couple of people got Your to head? see yeah. Otis. If, uh, if they watch the extended version on the Cosmographia YouTube channel, he ah. did, he did peek in there on one of the episodes, I think. Well, you oh, know, okay. His breed, which is Pyrenees, he's actually three quarters Pyrenees and one quarter Anatolian Shepherd. They were bred 
to protect flocks of goats and sheep from wolves. Uh, they are literally bred to kill wolves. Wow. So I got him thinking, well, just, you know, I mean, I didn't know, but I thought maybe there would be dire wolves in our future. And <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> always be pre prepared. <laughs> yes, always be yeah. prepared. That's my philosophy. Yeah. Winter is coming. That's right. So little note to everybody, be prepared just in case there are, uh, you know, packs of dire wolves. Yeah. <laughs> roaming around America. <laughs> could happen it's happened before it it's happened happen before again. <laughs> all right what else you got there russ all right this is from daniel another patreon supporter he says i am persuaded that the last ice age ended with a comet strike but i have a question i hope you can address in an upcoming video major glaciations have had a periodicity of roughly one hundred thousand years over the last million years the ice appears to have melted over a 10,000 year span, followed by a 5 to 10,000 year of interglacial periods like our own, then another glaciation, repeating 10 times over the past million years. Has anyone calculated the amount of excess heat required to melt the ice in each one of these glaciations? So that's the first question he's got. Okay, and then what's his next question? The next says, was Earth in the midst of a melt cycle when the last strike occurred? And then he says, one of the critiques of the black, ma black mat at the Younger Dryas boundary is that several black mats occur below the YD boundary at some sites. That could be ordinary forest fires, but that also suggests possibly earlier, lesser impacts. Is there any evidence of earlier or later impacts? Thanks. Okay, let's take Dan. those in reverse order. The black okay. mats are not exclus exclusively associated with the Younger Dryas boundary. That is correct. And they seem to be precipitated out or formed under conditions of moisture um, and the accumulation of, of organic material. Um, so that has been one of the criticisms is that the black mat cannot be exclusively associated with an impact. But there is a black mat layer that is associated with the impact. And that is the black mat layer that marks the um, period of megafaunal extinction, Clovis culture disappearance, and is marked by impact proxies at its base. Um, generally, most of the, I would say, uniformitarian explanations attributed to, to a rise in the water table. Now, I don't see that, that that necessarily is inconsistent with the idea that there would have been excessive rainfall associated with the onset of the Younger Dryas boundary, which would follow naturally, I think, from an impact into ice sheets. You would have, um, obviously, excessive rainfall. And when we get into this, as we're, we're moving towards that, but as we get into more detail, looking at the Younger Dryas, the, the melting of the great ice sheets, the extinctions, the... Uh, environmental consequences the, the, uh, the associated with those times, we're going to be looking at all of that. I mean, that's one of the main purposes of this series of podcasts that we're going to be doing. Uh, so at that point, yeah, we, we will address a lot of this in, in greater detail. But for now, the idea I think is, is that the black mats do seem to uh, form under uh, excessively moist conditions, perhaps uh, excessive rainfall, and we can't rule out the possibility that some of those black mat layers may be associated with other impacts, because I think there's evidence emerging now that there were, in fact, other episodes of, mel uh, of impacts clustered around the, the Younger Dryas boundary. Um, and earlier, um, even going back to 30 to 40,000 years. So that's a good question. And I'm, you know, uh, very interested in exploring that further. Um, the um, as to the question, was the Earth in the midst of a melt cycle? Right. He wanted to know if it was already in a melt cycle when the. Apparently, Earth I would say yes, because uh, as I've I've mentioned uh, several times in earlier uh, episodes, there appears to have been a melting event at fourteen thousand six hundred years ago. If that dating is in fact accurate. 
at 14,006, it appears that there was a melting episode, and then that was followed by a warming that could be explained by reference to the normal, the, the, the assumed uh, factors, which is mostly Milankovitch factors, which is the or changing orbital geometries that can increase or diminish the amount of solar heat reaching the surface of the, of the Earth. So what you had was a protracted period of melting and a shrinking back of the ice sheets to perhaps 85 or 90 percent of their of the late glacial maximum extent. So at the 12,900 boundary, yes, the, the ice sheets had already begun to shrink back. Although the bulk of the ice still remained intact, they had shrunk back. And this allowed, for example, um, megafaunal to migrate into the recently vacated lands in the northern uh, United States and southern Canada. And it, this may be a period of time when the ice-free corridor opened up between the Cordilleran ice sheet over the Canadian Rockies and the Laurentide ice sheet centered on Hudson Bay. And that would have created the so-called ice-free corridor. Now, it's questionable whether during the Younger Dryas, there's some evidence to suggest re-expansion of glaciers. In other cases, it looks like the, the recession of the glaciers merely stopped. Uh, it may have not been uniformly uh, a, a uniform effect over the whole ice mass because you're talking about literally millions of square miles of area and we're not going to necessarily be looking at a, a uniform response over an air, a geographical area so large but apparently there was a, a warming that went back to about 14 and a half 14 7 right in there years before present and ice began to shrink back and then all of a sudden that was interrupted it appears that that interruption was accompanied by mega scale meltwater, like we were just referring to the to the flood there at, at uh, Lake Nipigon, which we, we were just looking at the evidence for catastrophic outflow from the area of the Nipigon uh, basin. And that flooding has been dated at 12,900, give or take a half a century or so. So yes, it does appear that there was a melting underway when our putative comet strike occurred. So I would say yes to that. Right. I mean, that was, wasn't that initially like one of the mysteries of the Younger Dryas period before, the, you know, before the comet research group came out, the, the mystery was is that there seemed to be this slow, quote unquote, gradual recession from the, starting from the late glacial maximum going all the way up to the beginning of what was called the Younger Dryas. And the mystery was, why did it suddenly go, why did the whole world suddenly get, or the whole Northern Hemisphere suddenly get locked back into the cold again? Yes. Uh, so yeah, there there was a melting back, and then there was some violent sudden change, and that's the idea of the. And then there was another melting episode at eleven yeah. thousand six. Right. So my interest is in exploring the possibility of kind of a tandem event, or maybe even a perfect storm, where you might have had uh, impacts, but also associated with solar activity. Would you just to follow up? I guess the the cycles that he was talking about that are, you know, just the glaciation, uh, the stades and interstades. Uh, do you think every one of those is would have some catastrophic end and beginning, or do you think that that, that could most likely due to the sun? Because that's what I was thinking. The sun's longer cycles may be responsible for the sort of gradualistic. Yes. Stades and yes. Stades. But what I'm actually trying to move towards here is the idea of a coherent theory that ties together the solar system as a whole, that includes yeah. not only the planetary bodies and their combined effects on the sun, but also the solar response to the infall of sun grazing Kreutz type comets, which are now uh, a, a factor that we're realizing is, is, probably a lot more important than anybody imagined a few decades ago. Um, and the idea of when we go outside the, the, the planets themselves, which is just the inner part of the solar system, now we're looking at this whole p potential structure of, of primordial material that is linked as part of this system. And then that in turn is embedded in a much larger scale phenomena, a, a galactic scale phenomena. And then we get into some other interesting things like the idea that there may be some type of 
uh, pulsation or periodicity that is galactic in nature. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's really interesting, important ideas to explore here. And, and hopefully, you know, over the next six months to a year, we'll, we'll get to exploring a lot of those yeah. ideas. Yeah. The Kuiper, Kuiper belt and Oort cloud objects. Yes. Which may yeah. be affected by gravitational forces that have to do with something that's completely out of our solar system, or maybe center of gravity or center of the galaxy stuff, or possibly uh, orbits of other stars. That's lots of interesting stuff about that. Yeah. Paul La Viol Violette, I think is how you say his name. I've read his book. Um, he talks about galactic core explosions. Yeah. And I don't right. accept the idea at this point or reject it. I just have to think, you know, an idea like that, I have to really look at both sides. If there are critics, what are the critics saying? If he comes back, and just like you would through the scientific literature, somebody presents a peer-reviewed paper, then it gets attacked, people try to take it apart, and then the original authors come back and they respond to the criticisms, and it might yeah. go back and forth for a while. And I usually refrain from making up my mind until I've tried to work my way through um, all the different perspectives on things. So, but I'm certainly holding it out as a possibility that needs to be explored further. And if it, if it bears out, we might be looking at something on a galactic level that might be, uh, say, uh, affecting the influx of cometary masses to the inner solar system. And yeah. that in turn may have a whole series of consequences. Um, yeah, because right. well, we were expecting that in the next six months to a year, you were going to have this figured out. Right. That's you're what you're just you're only going to be just then exploring it. <laughs> we were hoping for answers. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's yeah. I, I, my plan was to have it figured out by next Monday. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, good. But if that doesn't work out, then Tuesday. <laughs> so. <laughs> but I agree. This like looking for cycles in astronomical. Uh, you know, events is is the way to go. And if you can learn cycles, mm -hmm. and then you see that there's all these different wheels, these all these different cycles, and when certain things converge, that's when stuff happens. And you can so then you can know you can see way in the future, like twenty thousand years, if there's going to be some kind of galactic event that's going to push Oort cloud objects towards the center of the solar system. And twenty thousand years later, those things are going to be in the inner solar system, breaking up and impacting planets. You know, I mean, that's a long timeline, but it's good to know because if it's yeah. going to happen in 40,000 years, it happened 40,000 years ago and they may be here right now. So that's well, we are going to be exploring the work of and, and my, my uh, reading of these guys literally goes back to uh, 1980 when they published a book called uh, The Cosmic Serpent. But this is Victor Klug oh, yeah. and, and Asher and Napier, because I think that what they've been doing is fundamental to understanding this whole thing and it's was very gratifying to me to see um those guys coming in and now being quoted uh quoted and and napier coming in and yeah in fact let's see where did he uh i guess say maybe even napier responded to our um infamous debate on joe rogan with um michael oh, yeah. Shermer, and uh yeah because uh yeah, I'm sure he did. It, it, we, we should probably in a future podcast uh, re read his comments about that because yeah. I think they were they were real good. So anyways, that gets us into the whole question of the Torrid Meteor Stream and all of that, which we will most definitely be exploring because it's right at the top of the list of things that are important. And interestingly, with the uh, which gentleman was it that was asking about the Halloween? Oh, have that's we, have um, we gotten to that question yet? We haven't gotten to that yet. one. I can okay. find it. Yes, right here. Martin. Martin, Patreon supporter, says, Any plans to do a remake of the All Hallows' Eve story? Probably one of my faves. One of my faves, too. Yeah. And the answer to that is an unequivocal yes. Yes. We will do an extended director's cut of that. You know, maybe we'll wait till we'll see. You know, maybe we'll do it near Halloween. Yeah. When it's appropriate, because it's astronomical in nature, and we could actually say, people... After this podcast, go outside and look to the south, and this is what you're going to see. Right. Yeah. So be patient. Cool. Be patient. Be patient, Martin. And Although, I will say, there's definitely a Torrid Meteor connection there. Yeah. And by the time we get around to it, you're going to have, if you're, if you're a regular, you will definitely have a much deeper insight into 
meteor streams and specifically the torrids, uh, the scientific, but also the mythological associations there, which um, get just extremely interesting. Yes, they do. All right, we ready for the next one? Well, yeah, wasn't the next question that, um, what was it, uh, David? That we're answering? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can go to David. He, he asked about, um, that was his first question, about the energy, right? Um, yeah, he was trying to go in reverse uh, okay. order. Yeah, let's see. I thought you were saying Dave. What was his name? Oh, Daniel. Daniel. It was Daniel. Daniel, yeah, Daniel Smith. We, did, we did read that one. He asked yes. about the, the excess heat. Yes, but he asked, actually, he asked about the black mat. He asked about the melt right. cycle and the excess heat. So yes. there have been some things done on that, Daniel, and they're older, but they're, they're still valid things. So um, I'm going to go back to a paper that I read many years ago that was uh, written by J.T. Andrews, who is a well-known geologist, glaciologist. And he uh, published a paper in the Arctic and Alpine Research in 1973. Now, as a little context here. Now, by 1973, radiocarbon dating has been um, going on for about 20 years. And as radiocarbon dating has evolved, you know, it's improved in precision, especially once it... Uh, they were dendrochronologists got involved and were able to now calibrate um, radiocarbon years with actual calendar years because tree rings provide a, a, a chronology that can be uh, counted in terms of annual rings, but being organic, they can also be radiocarbon dated. So you can count a number of rings back, then you can radiocarbon date, and oftentimes they don't hit exact because there is a measure of variability in radiocarbon dating, but it still tends to be very, very close. And the, uh, the calibration now is back to somewhere around 12,000 years, right back to the Younger Dryas. Um, I'm suspicious that there may have been upset in the radiocarbon dating when we get to the Younger Dryas because there was an enhancement of uh, radioactive carbon in the atmosphere, which we will come back and be talking about. But anyways, going back to J.T. Andrews' work um, that was published in 1973, by that time, what had happened is isochrone maps had been developed. Now, an isochrone map is simply a map of dots where you've got the same date showing up. So let's suppose you've got this massive ice sheet there, and it's coming down, say, in, covering Canada, coming down into North America. Now, it melts back, right? And where its uh, maximum extent was, you put a series of dots. And all of those dots will have the same age, because here's where it was at 15,000 years ago. Now it melts back after 14,006, and it pauses, maybe builds a series of moraines over a period of a couple of centuries or whatever. Then it recedes back again, some more. And in fact, that's kind of the model of recession. We don't see this. We see this. Boom. Boom, boom, like that. So now you establish a series of points that define the um, per margin of the ice sheet. And, and those points then would basically be all the same date. Connect those points with a line and there's your isochrone map. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I want it to be clear. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just simply a map that, that shows timelines where you've got a consistent date along that line. So let's right. say you've got the, you've got, let's say here's the Southern part of the ice sheet right here. So you draw a line right there and every point along that line, you do a date, right? Okay. Now those dates should all come up almost, almost the same, right? Now the ice moves back. A couple of centuries go by. You do another line there. Well, those dates are going to be younger, aren't they? Right. And so what you do, it's just like connect the dots. You're connecting the dots with a line, and anything along that line is going to have pretty much the same date. And that, so now you can, you can create maps of that, and those are called isochrones. 
Okay. So add that to your vocabulary. And Kyle, you're going to be working on uh, putting together a, uh, a the um, our dictionary for people, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Keeping track know, of these I, new terms as we introduce them, and then we can. Um, so that's real one people. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, man. All right. <laughs> So new job. <laughs> you've got RQ8, you've got isochrone or an isochrone map. So, anyways, yeah. What they what what uh JT Andrews was looking at was then now you had before radiocarbon dating, you had assumptions about how long it took for the glacier mass to disappear. Those assumptions were based on observations of modern glacial recession. Now, modern glacial recession, it's been witnessed by natural philosophers and then scientists for centuries now takes us back into the little ice age now to repeat again the little ice age was a period of not only colder weather but a concomitant expansion of the ice masses and in fact most studies would suggest that the ice masses of the little ice age and we're talking say 1600 to 1800 roughly right were as, as big as they had been throughout the entire Holocene for 10,000 years. So in effect, our understanding of the Great Ice Age was uh, made possible by the things that observers saw with their own eyes on a day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year basis as the swollen glaciers of the Little Ice Age began to recede back. Does that make sense? As, they, as, as that ice mass began to recede back, they begin to see glacial till. They begin to see, oh, well, here's an RQ8 moraine, which is RQ8 because it's conforming to the, to the, uh, you know, the limit of this lobate or tongue-shaped mass of ice, right? It recedes back, leaves a terminal moraine. Or here's a big boulder left behind by the ice that had been transported to the ice, a glacial erratic. So by seeing firsthand the creation of these landforms due to the recession of the Little Ice Age glaciers, they were then able to extrapolate to understand the much bigger landscape features that had been created by the Great Ice Age. Make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. Without the Little Ice Age, our understanding of the Big Ice Ages probably would have been delayed by a century or more. Hmm. Okay, so it was very fortuitous, the timing that the Little Ice Age was coming to an end, just as the, the scientific worldview was, was coming into being. And so you had people looking, and we talked about, uh, I actually talked about this on a podcast recently with um, somebody, maybe it was on Coast to Coast, you know, I did a Coast to Coast with George Norrie here a few days ago, and I, I talked about um, some of the origins of, yeah, I did, the origins of geology and some of the early uh, yeah. observational geologists like uh, Roderick Murchison and, and, and uh, Adam Sedgwick and others who were some of the first, um, you know, Louis Agassiz, others that were looking at these features back in the 19th century. So anyways, to get back to the point that I'm trying to make here is that Radiocarbon dating comes along, and over a period of the next couple of decades, what they're doing now is they're able to now go, okay, well, here's, look, here's a tree log that was left behind when the glacier was receding. Well, the old assumption was that the glacier ice mass was 100,000 years or 200,000 years to slowly grow, then slowly recede back. So that recession total might have taken 50 or 60 or 70,000 years. Well, then radiocarbon dating comes along and they're able to develop these isochrone maps. And the first thing that they see is that, oh, this happened a whole lot more recent and a whole lot faster than we had been imagining. So therein led to um, the title of this particular paper that was published by J.T. Andrews. And the, 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 the problem is expressed in the title. Here's the title of the paper. This was uh, Arctic and Alp Alpine Research, 1973. The Wisconsin Laurentide Ice Sheet. Dispersal centers, problems of rates of retreat, and climatic implications. 
Well, that's a pretty loaded title. The problems of the rates of retreat was simply that the rate of retreat was happening over a much, much shorter time span than anybody had been, you know, imagining earlier. So, uh, not very gradual is the problem. Right. Not yeah. gradual like they had been imagining. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it says with, by means of these now recently developed isochrone maps of the late Wisconsin deglaciation of the Laurentide ice sheet, estimates can be made of the changes in volume and area of the ice sheet. The average marginal recession between 12,000 and 7,000 years before present. Pause for a minute, because with calibration, those dates have now been pushed backwards by a couple of thousand years, right? So this is 73, you know, radiocarbon dating is still in its youth. The, the, the a calibration that they have done since then that allows almost a year by year correlation between the radiocarbon dates and, and you know, things like, I mean, they're actually looking at uh, coral uh, reef development. They're looking at, um, you know, um, stalactites uh, uh, and stalactites formed in caves because they will have annual layers that can be counted, tree rings, et cetera. So there's, there's this ongoing uh, refinement of the, the, the radiocarbon uh, chronology, right? So we have to jump, we have to push it back a few years, a couple of thousand years from these dates to get the more accurate dates, right? So he says, but the, but the point here, is that the average marginal recession is estimated at 260 meters per year. Ooh. 260 meters, that's uh, going to be 853 feet. Now, when you start at the glacial maximum, right, you're at the edge of the ice sheet during the, 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 the biggest part of the, of the glacier mass. During the late glacial maximum, now, in order to get rid of the ice, it's got to recede 800 and what did I say? 800 and 853. 853 feet on average each year. Each year. The next year, you're staying at the edge of the ice sheet. One year later, you go back and it's, it's, it's receded 853 feet. The next year, it's another 853 feet. The next year, and it's got to do this for thousands of years in order to get rid of the whole ice mass within this now much more constrained window, you see. Right. Therein is the problem. Now, here's, here's the other part of the problem. He says, the average marginal recession is estimated at 260 meters per year and varies little between the northwest and the southern margins. Hmm. Think about that. You would assume that under normal climatic conditions, the southern margin is going to melt a lot faster than the northern margin. Right. Right. That ain't what happened. In fact, the recession from the north and from the south was at the same rate. Actually, from the northwest, because the whole thing is from the northwest, it's moving back towards the core of the thing, which is Hudson Bay, basically. The southern margin is receding. Now, the point of this, oh, is that what you do is you look at glacial maximum, glacier's gone. You got this much ice you got to get rid of. And in that span of time, that means that on average, 260 meters or 853 feet every single year, year after year after year after year. Now, the other problem is that normally, remember now, a glacier is, you have to think of it as kind of living ice. You've got the zone of accumulation where the snow is falling and piling up year after year, and it doesn't melt. It just keeps piling up. And that weight of glacier ice just compresses down and causes the glacier to constantly be flowing. You know, the internal mass of the glacier is moving, and it's, it's almost like a, like a conveyor belt. And so it's moving, right? And then you get to the equilibrium line, which, which separates the zone of accumulation from the zone of ablation. And the zone of ablation is where the, the, the ice mass is melting away faster than it's flowing. So in other words, 
you've got this constant dynamic balance that's going on between accumulation and, and ablation. During times of, abl of glacial expansion, accumulation is greater, and now so the, the conveyor belt is moving and the gr glacier grows at its, at its ex extremity, right? So now accumulation is greater than ablation. Ablation is just simply the melting back. Now reverse that, if the ablation is greater than the accumulation, it's going to be melting back, right? But even though it's melting back at the, at the, at the margin of the glacier, it's still accumulating. It's still a living glacial mass. There's still accumulation. So the problem here is that not only is the glacier mass receding back 853 feet, but you now also need to account for the fact that the assumption it's is flowing at some speed as it's, well. Exactly. Yeah. It's flowing at some speed as well. So, so here so hard, very hard to calculate how much energy it would take to melt it because you would have to know the rate of accumulation and the rate of ice flow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a sticky a problem for sure, yeah. but we can work, we can make certain assumptions and we can, one of those assumptions is that we'll, we'll, we'll assign a date for LGM late glacial maximum. We'll assign another date where for all practical purposes, the ice is gone. So within that window, we've got to get rid of 6 million cubic miles of ice somehow. It has to right. melt and be gone, right? right? But that's it, sort of an underestimation because, again, you're talking about you have to factor in all of this accumulation through that time period. Exactly. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, it's it's not easy. Yeah. yeah. But so then Andrews goes on to say that this paper is mainly concerned with the rates of marginal recession of the Laurentide ice sheet with particular emphasis on the retreat rates experienced during the deglaciation of the northern United States and southern Canada and the Canadian Arctic between 18,000 and 7,000 years ago. Of primary concern is the energy balance at the margin of the ice sheet required to promote the rapid late Wisconsin retreat. And he says, he goes on to say that the growth and development, the growth and the development of the Laurentide ice sheet complex is still an enigma. Now he was saying that in 1973, after about 120 years of, you know, uh, in-depth glacial study, right? What was true in 1973 is also true in 2020. The growth and development of these great ice sheets is still an enigma, hmm. right? I want to drive that point home. He goes on. He says, unexplained is the growth of the ice cap in its gathering grounds of Baffin Island, Labrador, and Kewatin, where at least today there are low, low winter accumulation rates or accumulation regimes. Equally unexplained is the southward penetration of the ice sheet to latitude 40 degrees north or so, where even under full glacial climatic conditions, mass loss at the southern margin might have been considerable. Right? Think about it. I, I mean, because there's a normal, you know, you think about, you know, the seasonal changes in the northern latitudes where you get heavy snowfall, like where I grew up, you got a lot of snow. I can remember that well, because, um, you know, we lived out there in, in rural Minnesota on the edge of the prairie, and and we had a, a, a burn pit, a, a, a burn barrel that was maybe 150 feet from our house. And one of my chores was to take out and burn the trash. So I would do that regularly, maybe once a week or twice a week or whatever. So late fall would come, the snow would start, and I would shovel a, a pathway. By the end of March, before the spring melting started, I was in a slot canyon that was about six or seven feet deep, right? Yeah. Now, end of March, four weeks, five weeks later, boom, that's all gone. It's melted away, right? So in an ice age, that doesn't happen. I mean, I could go up to Canada now. We were just looking at a map of Canada up in Quebec. Same thing. Every year, you're going to have many feet. You're going to have feet of snowfall accumulating. Come spring, it's all gone. Now, 
when you have the onset of an ice age, basically, you're looking right. <laughs> Not there. Hmm. Anyways, <laughs> you have you have really what would appear to be an instantaneous change of climate. Because think of this. Imagine now that you have normal winter in northern, you know, over North America, northern United States, Canada, you have a snowfall, but then spring, come spring, that snowfall doesn't melt. Come end of summer, that snow is still there. So basically what you're talking about is that you go from a climate, an interglacial climate, to a climate where boom, it's like you get winter, but then the winter lasts for 10,000 years, you see? So now you've got this glacier growing to the south, and you've got the normal seasonal melt back that you would expect. Well, see, that further compounds the problem, and that's what he's talking about there when he says, um, he says that, um, even under full glacial conditions, mass loss at the southern margin must have been considerable. So during the growth of an ice sheet, which apparently grew really fast, I mean, in a geological sense, I mean, at, at 25 or 26,000 years ago, the ice mass was very diminutive compared to what it was 5,000 years later, 6,000. By 18 to 20,000 years ago, you had late glacial maximum. Now, in the literature, I've seen dates with a spread of maybe three to 4,000 years as to when the actual LGM or late glacial maximum was. Some of them put it at 18,000 and say, you know, the melting was already underway by then. Other studies suggest there was no really melting until somewhere between 14 and 15,000 years ago. So who's right? We don't know. But I'm sure that in the next few years, we're going to get more data on that that will allow, I'm at this point tending towards the younger, the younger um, dates, that maybe the full glacial mass was still intact at 15,000 years or later. But in any case, the problem with the rapid growth of the glaciers is that they grew so fast that it's hard to explain, well, how could they have grown that fast? Because the growth rate, you see, was as fast as the recession rate. So if it's growing, say, at 260 meters a year, but then the summer comes and it's supposed to be, you know, receding, melting back, well, then you have to somehow have a net increase of X amount. So that means that really during the season when it's growing, it's growing like twice as fast. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, that's the problem that he's... There's an yeah, and there's there's a he was asked so the original the commenter was asking about the energy problem of the melting and I think that's sort of what you're getting into here is that there's an energy problem with the accumulation as well. Yes. Yeah. Equally unexplained is the southward penetration of the ice sheet to latitude 40 degrees north or so where even under full glacial climatic conditions mass loss at the southern margin must have been considerable. Yeah. At its maximum extent, the Laurentide Ice Sheet Complex was approximately the same size as the present Antarctic Ice Sheet, which they're putting at uh, 12,653,000 square kilometers. In the last few years, the increasing number of radiocarbon-controlled marginal positions led by Bryson et al. in 1969 and pressed in 1969 to produce isochrone maps on the deglaciation of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. These maps have been used to estimate the changes in area and volume of the ice sheet as a function of time. The average annual rate of marginal retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet calculated from the reduction in area was 260 meters per year, or 853 feet. This high figure immediately raises the question of what energy sources are available to cause such a rapid retreat. A significant aspect of the Laurentide deglacial history is the high energy inputs required. The paleoclimatological conditions 
at the southern margin of the Laurentide ice sheet during the late Wisconsin have been discussed by many. A significant aspect of the Laurentide deglacial history is the high energy inputs required to produce the apparent rates of marginal retreat. So then he's concluding up, and then this is a figure, I'll pull this figure up in a, in a second here. He says the problem imposed by the estimated rapid rates of retreat is illustrated by figure seven. If the retreating ice sheet maintained a dynamic flow, the profiles of figure seven represent an approximation of the marginal form of the ice sheet. A retreat rate of 200 meters per year thus requires a tremendous vertical mass loss in the vicinity of the ice margin of at least 10 meters, possibly as much as 50 meters or of water. These are minimum estimates a vertical lowering near the margin as no account is made in them of the forward movement of the ice sheet itself, which in southern latitudes had to have been at least 10 meters per year. And I will do a share, share screen here now. We can look at, at figure seven. All right, there it is, figure seven. So what we're looking here, here left the y-axis, notices in meters. So ground level zero here up to 70 meters. So it's looking like about 90 meters when you get to the top. And then uh, the x axis is your recessional rate. And so you can see that if it's receding 200 meters per year, it's moved from the furthermost extent here on the left end of the x axis, it's moved back, let's say 200 meters. So what he's saying then is you can see the tremendous volume of ice that has to mm. disappear right? right now and then he's pointing out that at the same time the ice is still advancing it's still dynamic see so it's imagine thicker yes right so so you've got growing but it's still receding back at this average rate of two and then he goes uh 300 meters per year see um so this is this vertical loss this vertical mass loss now Hmm. What I would then say, and when I first encountered this decades ago and puzzled over it and thought about it, I thought, well, the assumption here is that you've got a uniform application of energy extending over whatever, eight, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 years, right? But what that is, is it's the net energy. And it's just an assumption that that would be distributed uniformly through the entire phase of glacial retreat, Right. What occurred to me is, well, I think what we need to be looking at is the fact that within that window of time, there were periods of massively accelerated recession or melting, so that the average over this full span of time works out to 853 feet per year. But that's not to say that any given year, it was 853 feet. And what we need to be looking at, I think, is that there were, and, and what we now know from the Younger Dryas, is it here's a, here's a period of time where not it, where it's even likely that the glaciers stopped receding and begin to grow again. Now, if that's the case, look what that does to our our window of time and 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 what we have to the, the scenario that we have to envision during that window of time. If there's actually thirteen hundred years where the glaciers are completely stopping their recession or growing again, you see. So now let let's let's go back to the. 853 feet on average per year, right? Well, now if you pull out 1,300 years where there's no recession at all, we have to subtract that 1,300 years from the total, right? So now what happens to the annual recessional rate? It has to increase even further. Yes. As, so as we get into this, I think you're beginning to see the problem. And this <laughs> is why, yeah, problems of rates of retreat. Right, and it's, it's looking at that graph. It's it shows you perfectly how m how much larger rates of retreat is a big problem because there's this enormous volume of ice involved in that. Uh, you know that there's a, we're talking about a linear distance, but it's actually yeah, it's a three dimensional volume. Yes. An increase in volume as yeah. well. Exactly yeah, as you as you recede back. Right. So if you look at that little ten meter ten 
uh, meters per year decrease, and it's just a, a thin line. Right. But right. The more the more it go the more it recedes the 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 more that uh, volume increases because of the shape of the entire and see object. what this so, ten meters per year represents is sort of the old extended uniform right. version compared yeah. to what they were re now realizing in the seventies. Right. So that kind of puts it in perspective. It does. That's really cool. Yeah. I think that we'll go one more slide. One okay. more. Well, one more. Um, quote here i think from we'll, we'll finish up jt andrews here we gotta oh, okay sure. let, let, let's do that um jump in the gun because he gets into some stuff here that addresses directly uh i think was it david david's question daniel yeah, daniel. daniel daniel okay so so with the the extended the the the, the, the higher uh marginal recession rate that means 45 meters of water Right, translates into 45 a depth of 45 meters of water, which is going to be almost 150 feet of meltwater now produced. Right, he says this if a mass loss of 45 meters of water is converted into the energy required to melt so much ice, then a minimum value would be 360 kilocals per square centimeter per year at the southern and northwestern margin, it is necessary to look at these estimates in the light of available energy sources. Net radiation, referring to solar radiation, is the primary energy source over most ice surfaces that leads to ice melt. Although with an increase in maritime influences, convection and condense, condense, condensation increase in importance. Net radiation is a complex heat source. It is the net product of incoming global and long wave radiation and outgoing long wave radiation and consequently is not an easy parameter to model. In the area of the former southern margins of the ice sheet of 12,000 years before present, the present annual net radiation amounts to 40 kilocal per square centimeter per year. That just means a thousand calories per centimeter per year, right? 40. Now, what he's saying is that if you're melting back 45 meters of water per year, that requires 360 kilocals. So that's, think of this. Now this puts it into perspective. If the present net radiation is uh, the primary energy source over most of the ice surfaces that leads to ice melt, right? So here, what, what's happening now is that he says that in the area of the former southern margins, the present, the present annual net radiation is 40 kilocals per square centimeter per year. Okay, with present radiation, there's no accumulation of glacial ice, is there? None whatsoever, right? right? So if you go up to the northern United States, if you're in New England, if you're around the Great Lakes, et cetera, et cetera, net radiation, 40 kilocals per square centimeter per year. Well, basically, for to get that 260 or 853 foot marginal recession, you need nine times as much energy. <laughs> wow. So just let that let that sink in. Digest that for a minute. How the hell do you explain that? Right. Now, this would be nine times as much energy extended over eight or 9,000 years. That's the total amount of energy to get rid of that effing ice mass. Wow. Right? So now you can begin to see problems of rates of retreat. Yeah. Yeah. And so then... What was it? Forty. It's forty right 40 now. Forty kilocals. Forty kilocals right now per square centimeter per year. Right. So, uh, I'm taking back to the during the accumulation phase and when the glaciers were like growing, it must have been much lower than that up there. But here's and, another and yet, problem. All that water had to come from somewhere. Right, which requires heat transport. Right. So that's wild. You must. It must have had a point where, like you said, it's constant winter for ten thousand years, and yet somewhere we've got enough heat to make all this snow. 
to accumulate six All that million ice. cubic miles of ice. Right. But bear this in mind, uh, Russ, the debate on climate change is over and the science is settled. <laughs> I just want to say Dang that. It. That 40 kilocals is like 267 Twinkies <laughs> in every cubic centimeter. <laughs> Saying. Okay. I just wanted That's to put it into Twinkies so that people right. can actually sure. understand this. 267 yeah. Twinkies per cubic centimeter. And that's based on the number of calories per Twinkie? Yes. <laughs> 150. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm gonna, I think you need to write this up, submit it as a submit it as <laughs> okay. a scientific paper to the peer-reviewed literature. Right. Yeah, it's Not, under review at the moment. Actually. Okay. <laughs> no glacier can consume 250 whatever Twinkies per cubic centimeter. Mm. Per cubic <laughs> centimeter. Yeah. Yeah. 267 Twinkies per cubic centimeter. I mean, that's <laughs> that's pretty. That's, that's pretty a serious. lot of Twinkies. <laughs> so. What he concludes here then is that these, and, and then he points out again that that further, um, you know, deepens the conundrum. These values have to be adjusted for the amount of net radiation falling during the summer months on an ice surface with an albedo of approximately zero point five for an effective computation of this energy source to ice ablation. So, in other words, normally you would have the melting is only going to be in the summer. Right. So there you can begin to see the more you begin to look into this, the, the weirder it gets. So, uh, yeah, then we'll end here. This is where we'll pick it up next time. And, and this was a great question, Daniel, because this is this is uh, details that I've been wanting to get out. I was planning to do it relatively soon, but your question served as the springboard, I think, to to actually address some of this stuff. Um, so I'll do one more share screen. And what happened was this, remember, this was 1973. And now we jump forward three years. And we have another geologist by the name of Kenneth Hare, who was at the time with the Institute of Environmental Studies up at the University of Toronto. And you see, where Andrews was at, his he was part of a, a, a colloquial a colloquium that got together, a conference that got together to address some of these uh, emerging questions about the the ice age, right? So now three years have gone by. Kenneth Hare is looking at the same problem. He's come up. His paper is entitled "Late Pleistocene and Holocene Climate: Some Persistent Problems." The persistent problems is that in the th in the ensuing three years since Andrews published his paper. Nobody's nobody solved the problem yet, <laughs> so it's still um, it's it's still a problem. Yeah, I'll I'll, okay. I'll I'll close with one quote from from Kenneth Hare uh, that'll lead us into our next episode. This was published in Volume Six of Quaternary Research, nineteen seventy six. Kenneth F. Hare, title of the, of the paper, Late Pleistocene and Holocene Climate, Some Persistent Problems. A series of lectures as comprehensive as those reported in this issue leaves very little for a general re reviewer to say. The lecturers have included many of the leading specialists in each of the subfields of paleoclimatology, upon whose work a reviewer must lean. Moreover, there has recently been published a fine synthesis of what is known about the overall character of quaternary and Holocene climates. All I can do in this situation is to point out some disturbing and persistent problems that tend to defy solution. My own perspective on these questions is derived chiefly from work along the fringes of climatology and ecology, mainly in boreal and Arctic domains. These reproduce living apparent analogs of the Pleistocene and Holocene ecosystems, from which fossil evidence for climatic change is derived. The first problem that usually escapes attention is nevertheless wholly physical. 
It concerns the energy requirements of glacial retreat, a problem clearly set out by Andrews in 1973. So uh, we'll pick up with that on the next one um, and his particular, pro his particular perspective on this problem. Um, and then we will close by saying this episode that those persistent problems and that paradox, that energy paradox has not been resolved as of this day in 2020, okay? After Kenneth Hare looked at it and his people at this conference looked at it, they decided that they didn't have enough data to really address the question. So they said, let's postpone addressing this problem till we have more evidence and more data. And now <clears throat> we're in a situation where I think, yeah, it's time to get back to that problem because we do have more evidence and more data in hand. Yeah, so and, they, they, they skipped over the problem and now we have people, we have these headlines that are like, the ice is receding and it's melting and all. Yes. <laughs> and they See, still well, don't even understand. <laughs> right. And this is one of the things that we need to address because what has happened is the whole question of climate change has been hijacked to the a political agenda yeah it has i mean and that's not to say that it's all wrong i'm not saying that i'm just saying that that the science has been subordinated to politics and what has happened is that these issues were were expanding exponentially in in critical importance as we get into the 80s and the early 90s and precisely at the point where we are beginning to open up catastrophist interpretations for some of this is when the whole discussion got shifted, got derailed off into the anthropogenic component, almost to the exclusion. Now, the, the other evidence, the other, the other, uh, the science has been proceeding on. I mean, what we've learned about the sun since the global warming scenario first got proposed in, in 1988 is incredible right so why is that new information not being included in the discussion yeah. but the other, the other thing is that we can't trust that they're ever going to revisit this problem because they've mm -hmm. got the answer already yeah for current energy requirements to melt the glaciers that are you know you see what i'm saying like yeah. they've already decided what causes melting glaciers in our current day and age. So why would they revisit that question? For the simple reason that what I just showed you is that, that the, you know, we're not seeing anything even remotely close to that today. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, and I think we can they, safely they, presume that Clovis, Hunt, Clovis hunters were not chasing down mastodons in SUVs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just good, good luck getting a grant Yeah. to, to study that. Uh, mystery is my point. Yeah. So the alternate would be that, you know, you had maybe 10 or 12 million probosidians that all farted at once. <laughs> that would be bad. It may not melt the glaciers, but it would be bad. Well, it could cause perhaps temporary runaway global warming <laughs> because of all the greenhouse gases injected into the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Temporary runaway Clovis people. <laughs> yeah. Because they would be running if 40, 000, 40 million mammoths farted all at once. That's right. Well, not 40 million mega mammals, but maybe oh, maybe right. 10 million mammoths. Okay, all right, yeah. I just recently read something, and I think this is too conservative. Somebody estimating uh, during the late Wisconsin, a total pop global population of 5 million people. I'll repeat, I think that's too conservative. But let's say it's even double or triple that or even more, you still got a hell of a problem, you know, exterminating yeah. 10 million proboscideans worldwide. Right. With sticks with spear points. I don't care how sharp those spear points are or how well crafted. Yeah. It's still a big deal to bring down a, a, a five or six ton elephant with doesn't two yeah, inch does, thick hide. Yeah. doesn't matter what the population is. You can't explain the ones that are frozen standing up. Right. Mm -mm. How We've got, uh, oh, I, great new paper. Um, it's not that new. It's a few years old, actually. Um, 
which we'll be pulling in to the discussion. Uh, great stuff here. Let's see, is it going to be backwards? Let's see if I can. Yeah, you got that image there. It's not even going to show it. We're not even going to be able to see it. <laughs> oh, okay. It just disappears. <laughs> well, oh, if you hold it in front of your shirt, we can see it. Oh, if I held it in front of my shirt. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there it's, back, it it's backwards. <laughs> not to us. Oh, no, Impact related microspherules in, in late, late Pleistocene, Alaskan, Alaskan and, and Yukon muck deposits signify recurrent episodes of catastrophic emplacement. Aha. Yeah, get that. Uh, signify recurrent episodes yeah. of catastrophic emplacement. Now, this is interesting because, you know, we talked in, in, in an earlier episode, we discussed um, the work of, of, uh, of Frank Hibben. Right. When he was uh, following the gold miners and looking at their blasting away the muck and, and, you know, then Graham Hancock did a really excellent uh, in, in, I think it was um, America before where he addressed the attempts to dismiss the work of Frank Hibben, yeah. right? Which, well, Frank Hibben, this and that, and we know that we can explain all this stuff by uniformitarian, you know, normal stuff. Right. Well, that's basically BS, you know, and, and we can, we talked about some of that, but we're going to get into it a lot more because obviously we're going to come back and regularly revisit this megafaunal extinction mystery. But Hibben certainly wasn't the only one who looked at the evidence and concluded that there was a ca catastrophic demise, at least regionally, as far as the, the megafauna were concerned. And this um, paper, which has come, came out in, uh, late 2017 uh, con reconfirms uh, the nature of the muck, the nature of the events. And one of the conclusions there of the authors that um, does include um, Alan West and, and Firestone, but the, the, the main author is Jonathan T. Hagstrom, uh, who's with the US Geological Survey. It also includes uh, James Weaver, who is, uh, with the Weiss or Wiss Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering, Harvard University. We have um, Ted Bunch, who is with the School of Earth Science and Environmental S Sustainability, uh, Northern um, Arizona University, and others. So, so um, these guys are looking at the muck deposits in Alaska and Yukon, and they basically confirm Frank Hibben's accounts from the mid-1940s. And we'll, right. we'll be diving into that because cool. it's really good stuff. It is. Yeah, I got that book, uh, The Lost Americans. Yeah. Uh, just started it a little while ago. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Really good. So I want to say a shout out. Thanks, Daniel, for that question. Great question. Um, gave us an opportunity to go ahead and get into some of this material that I had sitting on the back burner that I was planning to get into relatively soon anyway. But with your question, I thought, yeah, let's go ahead and address it because it's a, it's a, a, a key factor in trying to um, yeah. decipher this mystery. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, Daniel, for trying to jump the gun and move on to other questions before <laughs> Randall was there. That's why we're not in charge. That's right. <laughs> Randall is the uh, benevolent, benevolent dictator of the show. That's right. So. Benevolent, most of the time benevolent. Mostly, most of the, yeah. yeah, mostly. Not always, but mostly. Brad benevolent. can vouch for he can confirm that there are moments when. Right. There, there is evil Randall and, and evil Brad. Yeah. We know about bad Brad and evil Randall. Yeah. Well, there are, there are occasions where you might just get to witness the wrath of the Northman. The Norseman. Yeah. Oh, God. This sounds terrifying. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that the next episode is not necessarily the next episode. Right. That's right. Yeah. This is a special episode. It is not connected to exactly the in the timeline right uh oh <laughs> yeah it's all right we'll figure out a way to handle it because yeah we want to look at the uh the work of kenneth Hare to follow yeah. up because well, that hey. kind of concludes that that episode of those two conferences where these questions first ar arose yeah it might work out we just throw it in the timeline you know yeah it, it may, work, it out, may so. work out so mm -hmm. okay. it's all good all right. All right. Well, I've, I've got a few more, and these are real short. Okay. And then we can close it out. Um, first one is from Randall. You paying yourself, buddy? 
<laughs> you're, you're you're your own Patreon supporter. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Yeah, thanks thanks for supporting the show, Randall. Well, so yeah. Randall says yeah. <laughs> Randall says my contribution is small and all I can manage these days, but thank you for sharing what you guys do. That's what he says. Well, thank for for supporting us to even you know if it's only a couple of bucks or just you know yeah. you coming on and and getting something out of it. Um, that's why we're doing this. Um, Absolutely. Yep. yep. Every little bit counts. So thanks so much for that. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. All right, Susan. Susan says, after devouring everything Randall for the last half year, the least I can do is buy him dinner once a month. So she's. Oh well, I do eat <laughs> dinner at least once a month, so <laughs> shouldn't be a problem there. <laughs> thank you, Susan. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Susan. But where are you? I mean. <laughs> she's buying you dinner once a month now yeah on through patreon, patreon. <laughs> oh okay i thought these are all patreon supporters right <laughs> okay yeah. i see so we're not going out to dinner or candle at dinner or anything like that i am married but you know i have lots of female friends and my wife right. is totally cool yeah well we'll get you in touch with susan then <laughs> okay all right you're vicariously buying me dinner that's right through patreon yeah i it all see i still got to get used to this all this modern technology uh, no problem okay yeah. she can uh, always, one more she can always order dinner by doordash there you go send it by doordash <laughs> doordash yeah okay <laughs> okay okay roxanne this is the last one roxanne she says you are all so critical to this effort i'm upping my contribution to 50 dollars a month just wish oh. i could do more I wish you could too, Roxanne, but hey, fifty dollars a month. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. You're you're special, Roxanne. We're gonna have to do something for you. I don't know what, but you think of something. Come up with some good questions or something. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Wow, that's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Patreon supporters are great. That's what we've been going through, folks, is all the Patreon messages. We will get to the emails. We have a bunch of good ones. We have them, we're sorting through them. Yeah. Uh but you know, and got, look, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but Randall obviously wants to spend time on 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 these questions and consider them and give them uh, their due. So, right, this we'll continue to do these episodes. Uh, bear with us, right? If your question hasn't been answered yet, eventually we will hopefully get to it. Yeah, and then Randall will do a whole half a show on it, and it'll be fantastic. It'll be <laughs> it'll be awesome. That's the point. So, it'll take a while, but we will get to the questions. And thank you guys so much for everybody who sent them in. Thank you so much for the support, yes. which you can find at patreon.com forward slash Randall Carlson. Uh, there's also the website cosmographia.com that has a one-time PayPal donation button that you can use. And the website is, should I put the website in there yet, Brad? RandallCarlson.com. No, another couple <laughs> of weeks where we will have a, a new website. Everything's going to yeah. be reorganized and it's going to be awesome. That's all I right. can say. So yep. yeah, we're we're upgrading our efforts here to uh, you know commensurate with the the nature of the the subject matter, which deserves okay. the best vehicle possible for dissemination. Absolutely. All right, we've got a we've got a new partner we're working in, with, and he's developing a new website that's going to be uh, friendly to the podcast and all the new videos and uh, the the many many wings that Randall gets into uh, is all going to be able to fit in with the framework and you see the uh, graphic behind me. He's also a graphics designer and uh, going to be providing uh, some cool cool images for the thumbnails for the videos. So this is uh, the first one we got to go here on episode nineteen. All right. Yeah. And next time, Mike, could you try to hold it down a little bit? <laughs> I'm sorry. Was I too exuberant this time? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Way too much talking. Way, so way too much. If you could just, yeah. If you could just try to tone it down a little. <laughs> See, I, I ruthlessly made him mute his microphone because we could hear the, the TV slash dog, which no one could figure out whether it was a dog or a TV. And then he was laughing over there, but it was just. So I was feeling bad that Mike's laughs and stuff weren't coming through. Well, it, it was both the TV and a dog, or three dogs, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it was probably a better idea. That's right. But 
You just yeah. take my silent laughter is all you need. Yeah, that's right. It's purely visual laughter. It's, it's lurk, lurk, the laughter of the lurker. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you so much. This is a good show. Good I show. See, yep. you, see you guys next episode. Don't leave, next Mike. Episode, yeah. Stay. 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 <laughs> We're just ending the episode. Okay. You don't have just, to just vanish. Just know going ahead of time when, when Randall says one more, one more slide, expect six. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.